Здравствуйте. Как вы выживаете? Хорошо? Это прекрасно. Меня зовут Фрэнк Шерван. And uh, so, я очень рад с вами познакомиться. <laughs> all right, that's all I know. <laughs> and so it is good to be here uh, this evening, this uh, afternoon, to share with you the wonders and mysteries of God's living creation, especially when it comes to Mount St. Helens. Uh, I was alive when Mount St. Helens blew up, so that shows you how old I was. As a matter of fact, when Mount St. Helens blew up, I was on a city fire department in Colorado. I was a firefighter, and it was on a Sunday morning, and Mount St. Helens blew up, and we sat around the, the TV set of the day room at the fire station in Greeley, Colorado, and we watched the drama unfold at Mount St. Helens. And so it is very, very fascinating, and so we like to call Mount St. Helens an outdoor creation laboratory. Outdoor Creation Laboratory, and it really does show that you can move a lot of real estate in a short period of time. It doesn't take hundreds of thousands of years or anything like that. And so this is uh, Charles Lyle. He was very much anti-Christian. He wanted to show the world that the Bible wasn't true and that the, uh, the books of Moses, as he liked to say, wasn't really true. And Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland. He was not a scientist. And he was the one that dreamed up something called uniformitarian geology. And uh, Second Peter chapter 3 has something to say about that. There shall come in the last days scoffers saying, Where is a promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This slow and gradual process, Apostle Peter is talking about, something called uniformitarianism. That's a big word, okay? But uniformitarianism is a philosophy. It's not science. And it talks a lot about extreme ages, really long ages. And that's what we believe uh, the Apostle Peter was talking about here. And Charles Lyell decided to uh, uh, put together some philosophy regarding uniformitarianism. Well, the Apostle Peter continued in, ver in chapter 3, and he said, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And then look what the Apostle Peter says here. This is very important. He said, Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with what, class? Water perished. And here the Apostle Peter is saying the same thing that we read about in the opening chapters of Genesis. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we read about the creation of the world, don't we, in Genesis chapter 1. And then we read how our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned. That's the corruption of the creation. And then what did God do as a result of that corruption? Well, he cursed the earth. He cursed the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles. And Mr. Rob told you my background, which is parasites. I study parasites. Ugh, kind of gross. But uh, we believe that parasites are probably part of God's cursing the earth. So he cursed the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles. And I think maybe parasites are part of that. And genetic mistakes. Does anybody know what genetic mistakes are called? They begin with the letter M. Mu, yes, Mutations, A for the afternoon. Mutations, very good. And so maybe that's where mutations showed up and parasites and things like that when God cursed the earth. And then God sent a worldwide flood, a flood as the Apostle Peter is talking about here, and uh, a flood that covered the entire planet. How are we going to say that? Let's see, the creation, the corruption, the curse. Oh, we could say catastrophe, couldn't we? A worldwide catastrophe. And so we look at this worldwide catastrophe about 4,500 years ago. That was the time of the Genesis flood. And the flood lasted. How long did the Genesis flood last? Don't say 40 days and 40 nights. How long did it last? Yes. Very good. This young lady is smart. Boy, is she smart. That's right. The Genesis flood lasted a little over one year, and the rains from heaven came down for about 40 days and 40 nights, as Scripture says. And so uh, this is here. Uh, this is, is what the Apostle Peter is talking about. He said, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So the Apostle Peter is telling us exactly what happened in the beginning. And so um, let's see now. We'll move right along here. There we go. 
I'm having a little bit of tr there we go. Okay, so the world, uh, 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 there was a worldwide flood. So uh, this is an article written by uh, individuals who were not creationists, and they talk about Mount St. Helens being a 30-year uh, mystery. In 1980 outburst, the colossal event by modern volcano standards killed 57 people as rocky debris, scalding hot steam and gas, swept down the volcano slope at more than 680 miles an hour and reached temperatures of 572 degrees. It also hurled about 540 million tons of ash into the air. Now, this is said a long time ago. This is said in 2010. So there, uh, the, the Mount St. Helens since that time has been recovering, but that is a lot of material thrown into the atmosphere due to this uh, volcano that, uh, that occurred in 1980. Now, this is just one of the ash particles that came out of the volcano, and they used what we call an electron microscope to magnify this particle, and you can kind of get an appreciation for what that looks like, and this is how uh, it got into the air and got into cars and ruined the <laughs> the paint jobs on cars and everything else. It was, it was just a mess for several years after the explosion. And you can see that is a significant explosion that occurred the morning of May 18th, 1980. It's a northward facing blast, as you can see there. Well, why did ICR, the Institute for Creation Research, we're not uh, investigating it now, but why did ICR study the Mount St. Helens eruption? Well, there's three reasons why we studied the Mount St. Helens eruption. Reason number one, uh, from the, it, we have learned a great deal about the origin of rocks and geologic features happening right in our backyard, as it were. Reason number two, Mount St. Helens can give a glimpse into Earth's geologic power as we expand our thinking uh, onto the wide scale of the Genesis flood. So we as creationists, looking at Mount St. Helens, we use as a foundation, as it were, the Genesis flood. Because if the Genesis flood happened, we can learn a lot about this Mount St. Helens uh, catastrophe and apply it to our understanding. And then reason number three, the Mount St. Helens catastrophe becomes a scale model for the great flood of Noah's day. So these are the three reasons why we looked at and, and appreciate what happened on that uh, tragic day. You know, lives were lost uh, in the Mount St. Helens explosion. So in other words, and this is a key, students, this is a key statement right here, the Mount St. Helens explosion has completely changed our thinking on how long it takes for some geologic processes to happen. You remember the word that we used at the beginning of the presentation? It began with the letter U. Can anybody tell me what that letter word was, beginning with the letter U? Unify. Uniformitarianism, very good. Uniformitarianism, it's not science, it's a philosophy. It talks about slow, gradual changes spanning hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And so uniformitarianism, this philosophy that tries to explain the earth in very old ages, it's, is still pretty much the foundation of geology today. So let me give you an example, kind of an analogy here this morning. Let's say, for example, a man is in a 17th century sailing ship in the South Pacific with all the other crew members, and the sailing ship got into a problem and caught caught in a storm, and the ship sank with all hands, except for one individual who survived, and he was swept onto the shore of a desert island. And he kind of recovered and all, and then he made a little shelter. And he started every morning to look around at the beaches to look for any debris that might have washed up onto the shore of this, of this uh, desert island. Sure enough, one morning he found the captain's sea chest of that ship that sank. The sea chest washed up onto the shore. This guy was so excited, he took a rock, he broke open the sea chest, everything in there was dry, the, the chest was, was sealed. What did he find on top, you know, right at the top of the sea chest? He found the captain's Bible. Well, this man was educated, but he had never read the Bible before. So he took that Bible, he went back to his little shelter there, and he began to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, over and over again, he read the Bible. Would that man close the Bible after he read it for the 15th or 20th time? Would he close the Bible and say, wow, 
this planet must be 4.6 billion years old. Now, shake your head like this. Now, he'd never come to that conclusion. He would come to the conclusion this planet was only thousands of years old. And so uh, when I was in high school, for example, uh, back in 19... <laughs> I was taught that the, uh, this planet was about 2 billion years old. And now, today, in the 21st century, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. So it gives you an idea how long it's been since I was in high school. But that's, that's a pr the point that we like to say, because really what we do read in the Bible is uh, a, an earth that's only thousands of years old. In other words, this guy reading the Bible for the first time, the second time, and all the way through the 15th or 20th time, he would never read a phrase in the Bible that says, this planet is millions and millions of years old. He would never read that because the Bible doesn't teach that. And so we're looking at Mount St. Helens and applying a young earth idea to the Mount St. Helens catastrophe. And so um, let's see, we, we went through that. I'll get this straightened out here. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, one of my favorite pictures of the uh, record of the Mount St. Helens explosion. Look at the bottom here. We see the... Uh, we see the one day, this is a May 18th, 1980 explosion. Here's a, a young lady about five and a half foot tall, and she's standing there for scale. And this is the single explosion at Mount St. Helens, May 18th, 1980, all the way up to about this point right here. Then uh, a couple of uh, months later, still in uh, 1980, we saw a four-hour record of an explosion. So all of these sediments here, class, has been laid down over just four hours, not 4,000 years, not 4 million years, just, and even the evolutionist would admit, yeah, okay, this is a result from here to here of just a four-hour explosion. And look how much of these volcanic sediments were laid down. And then, as you can see here, in 1982, there was a second explosion at Mount St. Helens, not nearly as big as the first one in May 18th, showing uh, uh, one day of the accumulation of sediments in 1982. So what does this record tell us? This record right here, and this is a very significant, from right where this lady is standing going all the way up here, this has nothing to do with what we call uniformitarian geology, because what we see going on right here is just a very short period of time. That's nothing like what they teach in colleges and universities with this philosophy of uniformitarianism. So for that reason, I really do enjoy uh, looking at this slide and seeing a lot of geologic work over a short period of time. Well, let's uh, move on. And um, the laying down of these volcanic sediments was what? Was rapid. It was very rapid. Where else do we see evidence of rapid geologic processes. I'll give you a hint. It's here in the United States, and more specifically, it's in northern Arizona. Yes, that's right, Grand Canyon. I was in Grand Canyon last week, and so we look at Grand Canyon from a Genesis flood perspective. We understand that this is the greatest geologic feature in the entire world. This, if, if geologists really want to see the, uh, the power and the majesty of geological processes, you would go to Grand Canyon. And so I was at Grand Canyon last week uh, uh, conducting uh, day tours, just brief trips, uh, a partial, uh, partial way down of the Bright Angel Trail in the South Rim. But what we see is absolutely spectacular. So there's two ways to interpret Grand Canyon, as you see there. One is a little bit of water carving out Grand Canyon, sand grain by sand grain, by the Little Colorado River over enormous time periods, several million years at least. What do you suppose the second interpretation is? Yes. Very good. This young lady's right on top of it, the Genesis Flood. So we would say a whole lot of water over a short period of time. Do you notice the difference between the worldviews? One worldview says a little bit of water slowly carving out Grand Canyon, sand grain by sand grain. That's the uniformitarianism idea, that word uniformitarianism, versus what? A whole lot of water over a short period of time like you would get with a big, um, a big, uh, help me out, a big, 
Flood, yes, a big flood could do something like that. A really big flood. And that's exactly what we find. And so we love to go to Grand Canyon because it shows a lot of geologic work over a short period of time, just as it says in the book of Genesis. And so Grand Canyon has some basic questions, some fundamental questions. And this is interesting because this comes from a secular, that is a non-Christian publication called the Geological Society of America. And here's what they had to say. In spite of over a century of work on Grand Canyon, look at this, there are still fundamental, that is, basic questions about, number one, the age of the canyon, and number two, processes that have formed it. Wow, after all this time of studying Grand Canyon, they still don't know the age of Grand Canyon, and they still don't know the processes of Grand Canyon. Who said this? Well, this came from the Geological Society of America Bulletin, Volume 119, by a group of evolutionists. Remember that word I used? Uniformitarianism? These are the geologists who believe in the philosophy of uniformitarianism. But you know what, class? They're very honest. They're honest at admitting they don't know the age uh, um, of Grand Canyon or the processes that have formed it. So you know what we say? We're not uniformitarian geologists. We believe in the Genesis flood. So you know what we say? We would ask the, ge uh, the evolutionary geologist in a polite way, well, would you, would you step over to one side and, and let us have a say? Let us have an idea and, and share an idea as to how we think Grand Canyon is formed. Now, they just admitted they don't know the processes or even the age. And we're going, you know what? We have an answer to that. We believe it's a young age, and we believe the process was a lot of water over a short period of time, just like you would get with a, um, a flood. Yeah, a flood could do that. Okay, And so this is why it's so exciting to be a, a, a Christian geologist. We use the Bible as our foundation. We use the Bible to tell us about that. So that's my introduction. Now let's get to the meat, the heart of the matter, by looking at Grand Canyon, as you, uh, Grand Canyon Mount St. Helens, as you see here. Here is the, um, um, the pointer. Oh, down here. Okay, oops. I don't want to do that. Um, oh, great. Uh, let me do this real quick, and um, let's see. I have a friend of mine that uh, broke his arm in two places, and I said, Bill, you've got to stop going to those places. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here. All right, so what do we, what do we have here? We have Mount St. Helens, okay? And here's Mount St. Helens. There's a summit of Mount St. Helens, and there's a lake here. Now, the name of this lake is called Spirit Lake. And Spirit Lake is very, very important as we talk about the Mount St. Helens explosion. So right there is the summit of Mount St. Helens, Spirit Lake. And then in, uh, in the forefront here, what we see is some of the most luxurious, uh, wonderful hunting area that you would ever find in anywhere in the world, let alone the United States. People literally would come from all over the world to hunt and to fish in this area that is called Mount St. Helens area. And so this is a very substantial slide to see because this northward facing blast, the whole portion of this northern portion of Mount St. Helens blew out towards the north, in other words, toward us. And all of this material went six miles to uh, Spirit Lake and hit Spirit Lake with a miniature tsunami where you had a wall of water come up and do a lot, <laughs> do a lot of geologic work in a short period of time. So let's move on and take a look at a typical volcano. So this is your typical volcano. In other words, you'll never find a volcano exactly like this. But volcanoes are very, very interesting because they uh, show the majesty of, of the power of uh, the geologic work that is being done. So here's a question. What supplies the power for volcanic eruptions? Now, unless you study volcanoes, probably you wouldn't know the answer to that question. What supplies the power for volcanic eruptions? And the answer might surprise you. The answer is water. <laughs> water is what supplies all that power. Uh, superheated water found in the underground liquid rock called magma. So there inside the volcano is liquid rock. It's magma. Once it exits the volcano, it becomes something called, if you use the letter L, 
lava becomes lava. Okay, and so all of this magma is underneath there, and the water that the magma hits is turned to superheated steam. And superheated steam has a lot, a lot of pressure that can build up. If the pressure is released, the superheated water flashes into steam, uh, creating colossal power, unbelievable power. And that's what makes volcanoes so absolutely devastating. About two-thirds of what comes out of an average volcano is water vapor. You can't see it. It's superheated. And so you don't want to touch it because it would parbroil your skin. And, and I hate it when that happens. So um, two-thirds of what comes out of an average volcano is water vapor, what geologists call juvenile water. So you usually don't think of water when you think of volcanoes, but really it plays a very, very large part. The Mount St. Helens eruption of May 18, 1980, the most destructive recorded in U.S. history, unleashed the same energy as 400 million tons of TNT, or approximately 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. That is a lot of energy that is being released by the Mount St. Helens explosion. This picture was taken by an airline pilot. Nobody knew when Mount St. Helens was going to blow up. And so people who happened to be in the area and aircraft uh, started taking pictures. It destroyed over 230 square miles of forest just devastated 230 miles of forest. And uh, there was a lot more destruction that occurred with temperatures reaching about 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, uh, what's the scientific word? That's toasty. That's very toasty, okay? So this is a profile of Mount St. Helens, both before and after. We can see the Mount St. Helens uh, uh, dotted line there that shows what it looked like before. And then it exploded. And you can see that cavity, it's just a huge cavity in the ground because of all that energy that was liberated and released. This is a picture taken from my good friend, Dr. Uh, uh, Colonel Jeffrey Williams. Colonel Williams is a NASA astronaut. He's been on the International Space Station longer, I think, than almost anybody else. And he's taken not hundreds, he's taken thousands of pictures from the International Space Station, uh, literally covering the planet. He's written a book where he takes his favorite pictures that he took and has made it into a book. Since he loves the Lord Jesus, he's dedicated that book to the Lord and, and, and his work. Uh, but uh, this is uh, Colonel Williams took this picture uh, from the International Space Station in 2016. And there's uh, Jeff Williams there and spending many, many days and hundred, well, thousands of orbits around the Earth. And so um, this is Yellowstone. We've heard of Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone National Park has had the most destructive volcanoes in the history of the world. That's no exaggeration. And it happened at Yellowstone National Park. When did it happen? Well, evolutionists will tell you it happened hundreds of thousands, maybe even several million years ago. But we don't agree with that. We believe that these explosions that formed the Yellowstone National Park caldera that you see in that red outline there, that was formed right after the flood. So right after the Genesis flood, about 4,500 years ago, um, the earth was still reeling over the effects of the worldwide flood. And so there was a lot of what we call tectonic activity, this activity, volcanic activity in particular. And so you can see that uh, the caldera, which is basically the, the uh, area of the volcano, in an explosion of magma, more than 1,000 times greater than the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Now, we've just been looking at the Mount St. Helens explosion, how significant that is, and look at this. That was 1,000 times greater than what we saw at Mount St. Helens. Are we not thankful that that type of volcanic explosion is not happening today? I think so, yeah. You know, if... If, Mount, if, if uh, Yellowstone National Park blew up like Mount St. Helens blew up, that would devastate more than half of the continental United States, and the traffic could be tied up for miles. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's quite significant. So here, all these are what we call post-flood events. So we believe in the Genesis flood. That was an, a, a defining point in Earth's history about 4,500 years ago. And so look at this. You can see at the top of the screen there, with that orange block, that's a Yellowstone National Park. The evolution is, say, 2.2 million years ago. We don't agree with that. 
we agree, we would say that this is a post-flood event. Then another Yellowstone explosion occurred, and then another Yellowstone explosion occurred. One, two, and three, three of the biggest volcanic explosions in the world uh, today. Well, where is Mount St. Helens in all of this? <laughs> the answer is right down here. Mount St. Helens, look at that, that little yellow square there is Mount St. Helens. This is what we call, uh, in science, we would call that a dinky volcano. Dinky, can you say that word? Dinky volcano, that means small, very small. <laughs> and so this dinky volcano here is nothing like that huge volcano there. We can just say, wow, thank you, Lord, that the, we don't have explosions like that uh, today in the United States or anywhere in the world for that matter. So there's four stages of the Mount St. Helens eruption. First was an earthquake, 5.1 earthquake on the Richter scale for 15 seconds. I've been in a couple of earthquakes, and I tell you, one second seems like an hour. And so you have this 15-second, uh, 5.1 earthquake, and it was followed immediately by a landslide, which just happened to be the largest in recorded history huge landslide. Then the third thing that happened was a massive lateral explosion that occurred. And then four is something they call in geology pyroclastic flows, several hundred miles an hour. Do we not see a lot of geologic work over a short period of time? I think you shake your head like this. There's a lot, a lot of geologic work happening in a short period of time. And so here is a picture of Mount St. Helens just two days before it blew up. Did geologists know when Mount St. Helens was going to blow up? No, they, they, you can't tell. You know, And so they knew that something was happening at Mount St. Helens because the northward face, the northern part of Mount St. Helens was getting bigger and bigger and bulging out. And they realized, wait a minute, it can't keep doing this forever. Something has got to give. And so they knew that, that, was, uh, that something was going to happen. So they got an airplane, and they just happened to take this picture. Look at all that coming off of the top of, this, of, of the Mount St. Helens. What is that? That's steam. Yeah, that's steam from all of that water. So geologists said, uh-oh, something is going to happen. And so the north slope bulged from 5 to 50 feet outward every day. So every day, the northward facing portion of the mountain bulged out about 40 feet. <laughs> Man, something's got to give. And so they, they saw that and they said, yeah, let's, let's kind of monitor and see why... Um, there we go. Okay, and here it is. So this is an interesting story. Uh, you have a husband-wife team who are geologists. They're both geologists. They both have their doctorate in geology, and they didn't know when Mount St. Helens is going to blow up. So you know what they did? They talked to a guy who is a pilot, like Mr. Rob is a pilot back there, and they said, would you take us in your airplane and fly us into the crater of an active volcano? And what did this pilot say? He looked at him and said, sure. And so <laughs> he got in the airplane. The husband and wife, who were both geologists, got in the airplane. The husband had a camera, one of those old-style cameras that you never see anymore. And they got in the airplane, and they took off. Now, there was another airplane that just happened to be in the vicinity. And so they took a picture of that airplane that you see right there containing the husband and wife team and the crazy pilot, okay? And so they flew into the, uh, into the, the crater of Mount St. Helens, and this air airplane that this picture was taken from, they went home. They said, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not that crazy, and so they went home. So this is the only picture they had. So the husband said, well, let's just go in there and take a look and kind of... And so now we're in the airplane itself with the husband that has the camera and the wife sitting next to him, and look at what's happening right here. Do you see... Um, um, yeah, right there. Do you see that kind of powdery do, uh, residue that's coming down? That is actually that 5.1 earthquake. So that 15-second earthquake that's occurring is now uh, taking all this dirt and debris and rock and ice and snow and bunny rabbits and all that, and it's starting to come down into the crater there because of the 5.1 earthquake. But they didn't know there was an earthquake. Why? 
They were in the airplane, okay? And so they, weren't, they, they didn't appreciate what was going on. And so they took this picture because they said, Let's, let, there's a rock slide there. Isn't that interesting? All this material sliding down into the crater. And so that was one of the first pictures they took. And then as they were exiting the area, Mount St. Helens blew up. Now, if it was a traditional volcano that went straight up in the air, they would have been dead. And I hate it when that happens. But because this explosion was going towards the north, we call it a northward-facing blast, they were not in the way. They were out of the way there. And you can see part of the horizontal stabilizer of the aircraft. And so um, they had turned in their seat just to look at it to view, and they had what we call a ringside seat. They actually could see firsthand. They were the closest people to the Mount St. Helens explosion. And so it was a northward facing blast. And so the husband decided he would go ahead and wind the film and to take another picture. In the pro at the time of winding the film, he's leaning out of the aircraft window and taking the picture, this is what he got, this next picture. And so they're exiting the place uh, very quickly. The pilot has, is putting the aircraft in a shallow dive, 101 RPM on the engine, and they're exiting the area and watching this drama unfold of Mount St. Helens with its northward-facing blast that is doing so much damage and moving so much real estate. And so let's go to the ground now. They got back safely. Obviously, if they didn't get back, we wouldn't have those pictures, right? <laughs> and so there is an unauthorized photographer who witnessed the event. Now, let me tell you about this guy. He knew that Mount St. Helens was going to blow up. And also, he was a photographer. And photographers can, will do anything for a good picture, okay? They what? Oh, when they tell everybody? Why didn't he tell everybody? Well, he, he's going to right now. Yeah, when, when it blew up. So what, <laughs> what's really interesting is uh, he got in his old pickup truck. It was an old truck with his camera and his camping gear. He knew that Mount St. Helens was going to blow up. He was a photographer. He'll do anything for a good picture. And so in the dead of night with his uh, uh, pickup truck lights turned off, he weaved his way, he threaded his way through an old uh, logging trail. Logging trails are notorious for being uh, not very stable and all that. And he was going in the dead of night to an unauthorized area, an area that he wasn't supposed to be in. They called it the Red Zone. And nobody was supposed to be in the Red Zone. But he wanted to do, get a really good picture, so in the dead of night, he found a place, and he set up his tent, and he decided to wait for Mount St. Helens to blow up. And so in the morning, he woke up, and he had his little camera out. Um, that's not the guy. It says Gary Rosenquist there, but that's not the guy who did this, the photographer. It was at 827 in the morning, Sunday morning, and this individual is safe. He's uh, on the third ridge. The first ridge is right here. You see that first ridge? And then there's the second ridge right there. And this photographer is on the third ridge. So he's safe. He's on the third ridge. It's 827 in the morning. Do you remember that little um, uh, rock slide that occurred where they took the picture in the airplane? Well, here's the same rock slide happening at the same time. The airplane is too small, so you can't see it. But the airplane is somewhere around right here. Here's the rock slide. Uh, this photographer is on the third ridge. He's safe. He can feel the ground move. He's on the ground. He can feel that earthquake for 15 seconds. So that's why he got his camera out and he took this picture, and it's a good thing that he did. And so he wound the film of his camera for a second picture, and here's the picture he got. Wow. There's Mount St. Helens, northward facing blast. It wasn't a blast that went down and up. It was a blast that went out from the north. And he's safe now. He's on the what ridge? The third ridge. Here's the first ridge here. Here's the second ridge here. He's safe. He's on the third ridge. So he's sitting there and he's ringside seat. He's watching this explosion un uh, uncover, you know, occur. And look at all this. There's a bunch of debris that's coming out at twice freeway speed. All this material is being shot out by this explosion from deep underground of the earth. And it's coming out. And it seems to be coming his way. 
because it's a northward facing blast. So at, right after he took this picture, he realized, wait a minute, this is not your typical volcano. Oh, this is coming towards me. <laughs> but he'll do anything for a good picture. So what did he do? Instead of run, he wound the camera of his, the film on his camera, and he took another picture. And uh, the blast cloud spread out over uh, land speeds of over 650 miles an hour, and it's coming towards him. But he wants to get a good picture. So he stood his ground, wound the film, and there it is. But he's safe. He's on the third ridge. And um, here's the first ridge. It is uh, pretty close to being overcome by this explosion here. Here's a second ridge, but he's safe on the third ridge. And uh, all that material is coming out, and it is just devastating. It's very, very toxic and very, very hot because it's coming from the depths of the earth. And so he's a photographer who'll do what? Anything for a good picture. Okay, so he stood his ground, and he said, well, it seems to be coming towards me, but boy, this is, this is a really good picture. <laughs> so he wound his film and got another picture. Well, bye-bye to the first and second ridge. They have been absolutely overwhelmed by this volcanic toxic debris. And, and it's slowing down now because it has to go through the Earth's atmosphere, which is pretty dense at, at just about sea level. So it's slowing down. But look at that. It's still coming towards him. And uh, it's, he's on the third ridge. He's not so safe anymore. So this is a point where he made a very important decision. <laughs> he decided to turn the opposite way of where this toxic cloud is headed, which is towards him, and he started running to that pickup truck I was talking about because he wanted to, what's a scientific phrase, get out of Dodge, okay? And so he was running towards his pickup truck with his camera, and he put his camera over his shoulder as he's sprinting towards his pickup truck, for another picture. And so here's the picture he took over his shoulder. Okay. And this stuff is coming right at him, and it's fast, and it's deadly. And so as it comes boiling towards him, here's, uh, I think, it's a picture of God's grace. I don't know if this guy was a Christian or not, but you remember that third ridge I was talking about? Well, the way that the third ridge was designed is that when the material hit the third ridge, it just didn't overwhelm him and kill him. The material hit the third ridge, and then it went straight up in the air and then over him, just like if you were to take a, a teacup and to, uh, turn the teacup upside down and put it over an ant, okay? And so the teacup covers the ant, but it doesn't kill it, right? Well, that's kind of what happened here. This material went up and over this guy, just like a teacup would go over an ant, and he was the ant. So he jumped in his pickup truck, and he started racing down. Let's see if there's one more picture. There it is. Here it is. It's just all that material going up and over him as he's getting in the pickup truck. He said, this is worth a picture. <laughs> And so it's boiling over at the top of him, but it's going to come down, right, because of gravity and all that. So he only has quite literally seconds, not even a minute, to get out of that immediate area that he's in. So he took that picture, and then he stood on the gas of the pickup truck, and he started rocketing out on this old logging trail, getting out from uh, uh, un out from under the boiling hot cloud of toxic debris. You breathe it in once and you're dead because it's got so much toxic material. And so he has this bubble of air that he's surviving on and he's going down this, this uh, a logging trail and in front of him was a sedan, a sedan with a car of five people who were also unauthorized, who were not supposed to be in that area. Remember what zone it was? The red zone. And they weren't supposed to be there. And so this sedan of five people is in front of him. He found a wide part of the uh, logging trail. That's almost impossible, by the way. Wide part of a logging trail. He went around and passed them and kept going just as fast as his old rickety pickup truck would take him. Did he make it? Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't have these pictures. So he made it. He made it. Did that sedan make it? They didn't make it. They were overwhelmed by this material, and it killed all five of them. And that's very sad, very, 
very sad, but they weren't supposed to be there in the first place. And so that is it. And um, so with the May 1980 eruption, um, the force of water flashing to steam blew the top 1,300 feet off of the north side of the volcano. And within 10 minutes, the eruption column reached an altitude of 12 miles straight up. How do they know it was 12 miles? Well, remember I said the commercial airline pilots, many of them were from the military. And so they knew how to measure this column of smoke and debris and all that. And so they were able to make the estimate at least 12 miles of material uh, from the Mount St. Helens explosion. And so uh, here's another picture of it here, very graphic display of the power of God uh, of this material coming out. It's just in absolutely incredible, 12 mile. So about two thirds of a cubic mile of rock, ice and debris rushed at over 150 miles Six miles, uh, uh, six miles per hour, six mile, 150 miles per hour, six miles right into Spirit Lake, which was six miles from the summit of Mount St. Helens. And so this shows a very graphic display of what happened here as Mount St. Helens blew up. And then remember our photographer on the third ridge, which he wasn't too safe on the third ridge, was he? As this all, all this material came towards him. Well, this is the result in just three days. That's not snow, that's a volcanic ash that covered areas of uh, Washington state plus other areas as well. Look at all that uh, material there, all of this dust and everything else and people wearing masks and they also had um, uh, for example, they had to change the filters on their car, their air filters, uh, uh, several times every day to get it cleaned out and all. And so 50 million tons of ash was distributed throughout North America. 50 million tons. Yes. Uh, Mount Hanson in Washington State. Yeah, Pacific Northwest. And boy, was that an incredible display. This, again, is one of my favorite slides of the Mount St. Helens explosion because what we see are sediments, not flood sediments. These are not, and this is where the evolutionists try and trick us and say, oh, these, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. We're doing no such thing. What we see here, these are layers of volcanic sediments, sediments laid down by the Mount St. Helens volcano. Okay, now if we are in Grand Canyon, then you would have waterborne sediments at, for example, uh, uh, um, Grand Canyon. So we're not comparing apples and oranges. We're simply saying that you can get some very narrow uh, layers of sediments over a short period of time. And these layers of sediments, which are volcanic sediments here, were laid down just in hours, maybe minutes, some geologists say even seconds. Some of these fine layers here laid down in seconds. In geology, they call it pulsations or pulses where you know, we, we couldn't stand there and watch it form because you'd be parbroiled. And, and I hate it when that happens. And so they understand that this material was not there at the beginning of the explosion, but right after the Mount St. Helens, all this material was there. So it had to happen in a very, very short period of time. And so uh, this is something that I really like as a creation scientist because we can see it looks old, doesn't it? But it's not old. It was laid down in a time period of just minutes, hours, and days. And so uh, there's also rock slide debris. Parts of rock slide debris catastrophically displaced the water of Spirit Lake, which is six miles from Mount St. Helens, producing waves up to 850 foot high on the north shore of the lake. That's a tsunami. 850 feet high, that's a miniature tsunami in Washington state, who would have guessed? Um, as the water returned to its basin, it scoured sl the, the slopes of trees and soil and together with material from the initial eruption produced a 320 foot thick deposit on the bottom of Spirit Lake. And so in other words, do you remember that picture? I said it was a hunter's paradise where you had all those beautiful pine trees and everything else and people had come from the world over because of the pine trees and all the vegetation, all that. Well, that's what it looks like without the pine trees, without any of the vegetation, without any of the bunny rabbits or anything else. This water, this wave of water came up to the top there. It went up to the top after the material hit Spirit Lake. It had an 850 foot high tsunami. How long does it take for water to go up a slope, zoop, and then come back down the slope? 
zhup. Now, zhup, that's a scientific word. That means a big sloshing of water, okay? So it went up, zhup, and then came back down, zhup. How long does that take? Well, hundreds of thousands of years, right? No, shaking your head like this. How long does it take? Less than 30 seconds. Less than 30 seconds. And so can you get a lot of geologic work done in a short period of time? You shake your head like, yeah, yeah, you can get it done in a short period of time. All of that is carved out right down to what we call bedrock in about 60 seconds. Again, students, you should understand this idea of uniformitarianism, slow, gradual, geologic processes spanning hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of time, that's a philosophy. And this flies in the face of uniformitarian geology. And so here it is again. This looks like some giant took his fingernails. In Texas, we call these fingers, okay, fingers. And he took his fingernails, and he just kind of scratched it down bedrock in 60 seconds. And so that's what we find. The water, and here's the pristine waters of Spirit Lake right here. It, when the debris hit Spirit Lake waters, it went up 850 feet. What's that geologic term? Zhup. And then came back down again. Zhup. In, in 60 seconds or less. And it was so catastrophic. There was so much material there that it actually carved it right down to bedrock. Uh, if an individual didn't know that that was Mount St. Helens that did that, they would say, well, this is uh, erosion over hundreds of thousands of years, and they would be wrong. This is material that just occurred through the effects of the, of the Mount St. Helens explosion. Um, it says, uh, the water washed up onto the surrounding slopes, destroying trees, and then dragging them back down into the lake as the water flowed back downhill. Very short period of time. And so here it is. This is the road at Mount St. Helens. It's always been there. And it used to be through that pristine forest that we talked about. Now it looks like just matchsticks. And it looks like a lunar landscape. It looks like the results of a thermonuclear blast. And I'd like to say at this point, remember at the end of the Genesis flood uh, 4,500 years ago? The flood lasted a little over one year. And so at the end of the flood year, when, uh, when um, his, his wife, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives were standing on the deck of the ark, they were looking out in an area that looked just like this after the Genesis flood. And I'm sure one of the sons said to his dad, Mr. Noah, he said, Dad, look at this. It looks like a thermonuclear blast zone. And probably Noah said, yeah, I know, son, this looks like a lunar landscape. Well, maybe they didn't say it that way. But right after the Genesis flood, that's kind of what we would see, or even less than that. But because God is in charge of everything, we find that the environment can, uh, can recover. There can be substantial recovery over a short period of time. And this is an exhibit right here of substantial recovery after an incredibly devastating blast of material. And so I have a whole hour-long presentation just on Mount St. Helens recovering after the, uh, after, uh, the Mount St. Helens explosion. And I also have that in, in Russian, that whole presentation in Russian, the recovery of uh, Mount St. Helens. So here it is. We find no less than 30 bridges in the area were torn out due to the streams and rivers that go under the bridge getting clogged with all of this debris material. And this material, the debris and the tree trunks and all that would go up against the bridge and there'd be more and more coming up behind it and it would just tear out the entire bridge. As I say, about 30 bridges were taken out as a result of the explosion at Mount St. Helens, just a river of debris causing a lot of damage. And then here we have it at Spirit Lake. Spirit Lake, over a million logs went into Spirit Lake. And then these logs became waterlogged, and as the logs rubbed up against each other, the bark became heavy with water and then sank to the bottom of Spirit Lake and made a very significant layer of material there at the bottom of Spirit Lake. And so um, this is a log mat of over four million trees floating in Spirit Lake. This, occur this picture was taken just a few months, maybe a year after Mount St. Helens blew up. And you can see just how stark the environment is uh, from the Mount St. Helens explosion, but how rapidly there was a recovery 
of Mount St. Helens area, rapid recovery, can we not apply that to the Genesis flood as well? Rapid recovery, short period of time. Here are some of the logs that are floating straight up and down uh, that were not part of the uh, Spirit Lake, obviously. They got thrown into Spirit Lake. They became waterlogged, and then they sank down, roots down, trunk up, and uh, it, it kind of looks, you know, looks strange. It looks kind of, the, the scientific word is spooky. It looks kind of spooky with those tree trunks going down into the uh, material of Mount St. Helens Lake, the Spirit Lake there. And so here's a graphic uh, way of uh, showing that. You have the uh, floating logs. Um, they get buried in the sediments and all that. And it kind of looks like an ancient forest, but it's nothing of the sort. It's not an ancient forest as well, at all. It just is how they got buried right after the explosion of Mount St. Helens. And my friend Steve Austin took a picture. He went into Spirit Lake. That He was told by many people, don't go into Spirit Lake. A lot of high count of bacteria, lots and lots of bacteria in the water. But also, there's all sorts of debris there, and you can get your regulator torn out of your mouth. And, and uh, so it was a very, very dangerous dive to make. But Steve and his diving buddy went down there. And so these are the root ends of a Douglas fir tree deposited on the bottom of Spirit Lake. This was taken by Steve Austin. And so that is just an incredible, incredible picture to take. I, I like to scuba dive when I have a chance, but I don't know if I go down the bottom of Spirit Lake or not. And so the June 1982 eruption, two years after the Mount St. Helens explosion, the heat generated from the explosion melted frozen mud, producing a mud flow that filled up the North Fork of the Toodle River. The smoke cleared five days later to reveal that the mud flow had eroded a zigzag main channel with many sharply tapered side canyons. You know what that looks like? That looks like a miniature Grand Canyon. That looks like a 140th scale model of Grand Canyon that we looked at a few minutes ago. And so um, uh, sharply tapered side canyons, wait a minute, Grand Canyon has sharply tapered side canyons as well. That's kind of interesting. Uh, horizontal bands of sediment, some thick and some exceedingly fine, line the walls of the newly formed canyon. And so that's kind of neat. We have a 140th scale model of Grand Canyon there in the North Fork of the Toodle River of Mount St. Helens. And here's an even big, better picture. And it shows this little bit of water here going through these canyon sidewalls here. So if somebody were to look at that, they'd say, well, it's obvious. This little bit of water carved this out over thousands and thousands of years. And you know what? They'd be 100% wrong. They'd be 100% wrong. We know that this was formed in 1982 over a short period of time. So that's all I have about Mount St. Helens and the 1982 Mount St. Helens explosion. You have been a wonderful class. And Pastor, I'll, I'll turn it over to you or anybody else who...